Hello again, my dear students, and welcome to a new chapter in our energy harvesting module. Today, we are starting a new journey with a new source of energy. In the previous lecture, we have considered together what's called the light harvesters. Whenever the source of energy is light, either this light is a simple solar spectrum or any type of artificial lighting. Today, we are going to start a new process with a new source of energy. And this time, our source of energy will be thermal energy. That's why we call it a thermoelectrical energy harvester. Generally speaking, thermoelectrical effect can have different shapes and different coefficients. But maybe the most famous two structures of thermoelectrical effects is what's called the polar effect and what's called the thebic effect. The polar effect is a cooling effect forced by an electrical current. So, as you can see here, you have an electrical energy source like this one, and this electrical energy source conducts an electrical current in a terminal causing this terminal to get high temperature with respect to another cold surface with the blue, as you can see, this one. So here in your input is an electrical energy in a form of an electrical current. And based on this electrical energy, you convert it into a delta T or a difference, difference in temperature. Or in other words, you convert it into a thermal energy. Alternatively, my dear students, we have another form of a thermoelectrical effect, which we call a CPIC effect. In a CPIC effect, there is a hot terminal or a hot surface and a cold surface. And based on this input delta T, so now the input is delta T. So now, I'm sorry, now, that the, the, the difference in temperature is the input. This delta T is the input. And based on this delta T, you got an electrical current and electrical voltage to conduct an electrical load. This what we call a CB coefficient. And as you can understand from the process, our focus today as an energy harvester will be towards the CPIC coefficients or the CPIC effect as a type of a thermoelectrical effect. So, in order to understand the basic principle of the CPIC coefficient or the CPIC effect in a material, we have first to recall some semiconductor fundamentals related to our basic understanding of a material and the semiconductors. So, let's now start with recalling some semiconductors. Principally, whenever you are going to demonstrate a semiconductor material, and as we already learned that in our previous courses, as well as in a, the previous chapter with light harvesters, we can represent the semiconductor in a form of an energy band diagram, including a valency band, a conduction band, and in between we have what's called the energy gap. Normally speaking, electron occupy the valency band and bond it in what's called the covalent bond. But due to some intrinsic or extrinsic energy, some electrons can move from the valency band to the conduction band, leaving what's called the hole. What's really interesting here, my dear students, is whenever we consider the intrinsic source of energy, we will find that this intrinsic source of energy is typically a thermal energy, this 3 over 2 kT. So, from this, we can understand that a thermal energy is one of the sources that can capable or can able to break the bond of an electron in the valency band and move to the conduction band, leaving a hole. And here, this is what we can call a generation source. So you can generate an electron hole pair, you can generate an electron and hole pair by using an external source of energy, which can be a thermal energy. 
But the question will be how this electrical energy or how the difference in electrical energy can come up with an electrical voltage or current. So to understand this, we will need to recall another semiconductor uh, foundational perspective, which is the electrical term. I think all of us know what is an electrical term. And if you go back to your foundational high school classes in physics, for example, you will remember this relation mentioning that I equal dq by dt, or electrical current is the rate of a change of a free carrier. These free carriers can be an electron or can be an hole. So in order to have an electrical current, you have to have first free carriers, then this free carrier should transport, should move to validate this d by dt or the rate of change with respect to time. Following the basic drift diffusion principle, this motion of electrical current or electrical carrier can be out one out of two reasons. The first reason, which is more logic or more close to our electrical engineering background, is what's called the drift phenomena. So generally speaking, when you have a conduction band, a valency band, and a, and, and a Fermi level in a semiconductor, once you connected this, this material with an external source of energy, what will happen simply that a tilting will happen in the energy band diagram, leading an, to a, an electron to move to the conduction, uh, to the positive terminal, and a hole to move to the negative terminal. I think this is a very basic concept of moving a current in a material. And herein we use the basic drift equation till we reach the fundamental Ohm's law, mentioning that the electrical current conductivity or J equals, sorry, the electrical current density J equals to sigma, which is, which is the electrical conductivity times eta, which here represents the uh, electrical field applied due to the potential source. So this is the main concept where we have V equals I times R, the basic Ohm's law. And we can, of course, see this in different forms, whether the material is an N-type or the material is a P-type. But actually, there is another reason or another source for current motion, which we call the diffusion current. The basic principle of a diffusion current is related to difference or variation in concentration. The process is simply as if you have a material where a portion of a material is with high carrier concentration, for example, high electron concentration, and the other portion of a material is with a low carrier concentration. What will simply happen is carrier will diffuse from a higher concentration region to a lower concentration region till we reach what's called an current or a carrier balance. So as you can see here, or as we can reach a uniform distribution. This is the very easy way where we can understand the diffusion process. Here in we can say that the current flowing in a, in, 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 in a junction is equal to Q, where Q here represents the charge. Here I, I use the negative sign to mention that it's an electron because this is Jn or a current due to electron, times Dn, where Dn is the diffusion coefficient, times Dn by Dx or the rate of a change of carrier or here electrons concentration. So if the n by the axis is equal to zero, I mean it's a uniform distribution, then simply you will not have an uh, diffusion current. Diffusion current is exist as far as the n by the x exists. Alternatively, you can write a similar equation for JP with a, a with a negative without a negative sign here. I will mention why these negative signs appear. So this is a negative Q dp dp by dx. And similarly, here as you can see, the 
rate, the diffusion current due to Hooves is simply due to the rate of a change of the whole concentration, or sorry, the, the change of whole concentration with respect to X, this dp by dx. So why we have these negative currents? This negative current is actually related to the flow. As you can see, current move from the higher concentration, sorry, from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. That's why current Okay, so let me try to use an, a pointer here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry for that. So let me stop again. Okay, I'm just trying to open my laser uh, pointer. So, uh, okay, perfect. So uh, current is moving from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. So, this slope indicating the flow of the current from the higher concentration to the low con concentration represent a linear slope with a negative sign. That's why we have a negative sign here and a negative sign there. However, for electrons, this Q itself is with a negative sign. So that's why negative times negative tends to positive. By, while with holes, we have this negative uh, sign is still kept because holes are a positive charge. So simply speaking, as you can see, my dear students, well, as you can see, my dear students, this slope is negative. That's why we have a negative here, a negative here, and then negative, negative, positive, while this negative will keep negative. So generally, this is what's called a drift diffusion model with a current, drift current, due to electrical field, and a diffusion current due to change in concentration, either in electrons or in holes. And this is what we call the drift diffusion model. But what is still interesting, maybe your, what you are asking now is, what is the relation between the thermoelectrical material and between this drift diffusion model? Let's see this, what's called the Einstein coefficient. And this Einstein coefficient relates the dN and dP, which is the diffusion rate in electrons and holes, with the mu N and mu P, which are the mobility of electrons and holes. And then, as you can see from this relation, that the, the diffusion coefficient, either in electrons or in holes, is directly proportional to the temperature, which return back to the main concept of diffusion. So the higher the temperature, the higher the diffusion rate. So diffusion and temperature are directly proportional, as you can see in this model. So again, how we can use this concept in verifying the thermoelectrical effect? So this is a basic PN junction where we have a P side and N side. If you remember, I use this as typical schematic to uh, implement the concept of a light harvester one chapter ago. And now we are going to use the same concept in order to implement the thermoelectrical concept. If you remember, my dear students, extra temperature is considered as a source of energy for a material. So. If I, if, I, if I assume that I, uh, sorry, let me close this. Okay. If I assume that I expose this side of a material, which is the P side, if I expose this side of a material to a high temperature condition, then I should expect that the rate of carrier generation, electrons and holes, in this side, in the VP side, will be greater than the rate of carrier concentration in the other side. The other side will still be an, a, a normal extrinsic material under thermodyna thermodynamic equilibrium, while the P side will be no longer under thermodynamic. It will be uh, generated with an exposed external source leading to 
high generation of electrons and holes, or in other words, n times b will be greater than ni. What will happen is simply that you will have electrons to be created here. Once this electron is created, then it will automatically drift in this building potential drift, creating an electrical current. So what you did now, first, you make an electron hole per generation in a one side of a PN junction, then you generate new electrons and new holes, then these electrons will drift using the building potential in the uh, using the building potential in the BN junction, creating an electrical current. So as you can see, it's typically the same as when we consider the uh, case with the light harvester. The only difference is our source of energy now is not an uh, light or a photon. Our source of energy now is the thermal energy. So back from semiconductors, and now let's go back to the normal macroscopic view of material, how we can consider the Seebeck effect. So generally speaking, we can consider Seebeck effect as the variation of temperature to the variation of voltage. So using this equation, as you can see here, a, a, a Seebeck effect between two points A and B can be considered as the voltage between A and B over the delta T or the delta, the, 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 the difference in temperature between point A and B. Alternatively, you can make a coefficient considering the pilar coefficient, which links the electrical currents, the source of heating, which is an electrical current, to the rate of heat or cooling at, we, at each junction, which is Q. By analogy between the S and the Y coefficient, you can understand that it's a relation between the output and the input, where the output is in the denominator and the input is the denominator. So in a CP coefficient or in the CP effect, your input is a delta T, your input is a different in temperature, and your output is a voltage. So that's why the CPIC is, is defined as V over delta T. While in a, in a pilot coefficient, you have an input of an electrical current, which is I, and an output of heat of heat uh, change, which is Q. So the, the ratio is between the output and the input, which is Q over I. As I mentioned earlier in the beginning of this lecture, we are more concentrating toward that CPIC coefficient, because this is the coefficient of electrical energy generation, which is a part of our course as an energy harvester. So let's go now in more details to understand the process of a CB coefficient, or in another words, to understand the analytical mathematical model uh, associated to a CB effect in a thermoelectrical material. So, well, let's go step by step or equation by equation. Okay, so first of all, from the previous equation, we can say that gener generated voltage is simply equals to SAP or the CP coefficient. Now we call it SN and SP because simply we have a P side and an N side as a P and junction. So SP minus SN represents simply SAP or the CP coefficient of the junction multiplied by the delta T, which is T high minus T cold, T hot minus T cold, as you can see. So this is, this is sim simply the voltage equation or the uh, electromagnetic field uh, induced as a result of this voltage. In order to calculate the current, as you can know, I equals to V over R. So what we happen, what happened is simply we get the same equation of EMF or the voltage, and we divide it over the overall resistance. Herein we consider an equivalent resistance of RP to represent the, res the resistance of the P side, RN to represent the resistance of the M side, and R load, which is the load resistance, your connected load. Uh, so in order to calculate the 
power or the total extracted electrical power, power equals R squared times RL. So simply this is R squared and this is RL. On the other hand, you have you need to, to know the input. Your input represents the electric or the thermal energy flow in this junction, which is calculated as SP minus SN times I times C1 or over T1 plus KP plus KN times C hot minus C cold. This KP and KN represents what we call the thermal conductivity of a material. So if the electrical conductivity is considered as sigma, the thermal conductivity will be Kp plus Kn, or Kp represents the thermal conductivity of the PSI, and Kn represents the thermal uh, 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 represents the thermal conductivity of an site. So you can say that the efficiency of your harvester is simply your output power over your input power. Your output power is W, which is the electrical power, R squared RL. And your input power is this Q1, which represents an, uh, an input power of a, a, a thermal energy, a thermal energy input power. So by dividing W over Q1, you get the efficiency of your thermoelectrical harvester. You can maximize, if you remember, we do the same in the case of a, a light harvester, where we plot the IV curve of a light harvester, and uh, we, 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 we um, discuss together the maximum power point and all this stuff. So you can do a similar approach here by determining the point at which the power or the efficiency is maximum, and you can here calculate the maximum efficiency in terms of this point M, which, is, which represents the point of maximum uh, efficiency. What is interesting here is this new parameter Z, or what we call the Z parameter for a material. So what is this, what is the Z parameter for a material? A Z parameter for a material is simply given as S square sigma over K, where S is a CP coefficient of a material. Again, it's a ratio between the voltage to be generated over the difference in temperature to be exposed. Sigma, we already know sigma, which is the electrical conductivity of a material, and K, which is a thermal conductivity of a material. I can say that this Z parameter represents an inclusion parameter that include the main three factor of a thermoelectrical material. So with considering the name as a thermoelectric material, so we have two parts of this name. First related to the thermal conductivity of a material, which is K. Second is related to the electrical conductivity of a material, which is sigma. And third, which is the, the conversion ratio which is the CP coefficient. So we, we consider this coefficient as the conversion coefficient. The CP coefficient consider or tell you how much voltage you will get for which input delta T or difference in temperature. So by considering these three parameters, S, S square, sigma, K, you can consider your thermoelectrical material. By the way, this Z parameter has a, has a unit of one over temperature or Kelvin to the minus one. That's why the term ZTT is simply a dimensionless term. And if you go to literature to check papers related to thermoelectrical harvester, you will usually find this curve where we plot the efficiency eta with respect to Z, this Z, ZT term, or ZT term. The ZT term represents the capability of a material to act as a thermoelectrical harvester. And from this coefficient, you can guess that your ideal material is a material with high electrical conductivity, high CB coefficient, low 
thermoelectrical, uh, sorry, low thermal conductivity. So whenever you have high electrical conductivity, high CB coefficient, low thermal conductivity, your Z parameter will get high, resulting with a high ZT coefficient. Now, I will try to reflect what we have understood in the form of a CP coefficient to a typical energy harvesting application. As you know, the focus of this course is not toward a semiconductor material or a thermoelectrical material. It's more toward a device level. So I'm going to demonstrate to you one of our previous experiments of fabricating and simulating a real thermoelectrical harvester. This work has already been published in and presented in IEEE conference in 2019 under the name Enhancing Photovoltaic Performance Under Harsh Condition Using ca Calibrated Solar Signal. The idea is very simple. And actually, I, I choose this application in specific because I believe that this is somehow an integrating application between our two chapters. The first chapter dealing with light harvesters and the second chapter dealing with thermoelectric harvesters. So in the first uh, chapter, we have learned together that the light harvesting is a process of capturing photons and converting it into electrical energy. This happened by some sort of a spectrum. So let's consider, for example, the solar spectrum, where we have already discussed this a lot. But we mentioned that this solar spectrum still contain what's called an ultraviolet photon, which is a high energy hot photon. And this high energy photon, or in other words, the excess energy above EG will be converted into the material in a form of a thermal energy. And this is the reason why when you consider any solar cell, and you check the data sheet of a solar cell, you will find these three famous coefficients, alpha, beta, and gamma. These three famous coefficients are relating the performance of a solar cell, or the main parameter of a solar cell, with temperature. So alpha represents the percentage of increase in the short circuit current with respect to each degree Celsius, while beta represents the percentage of decrease in the voltage, which with each increase of degree Celsius temperature. And finally, gamma represents the same for the overall power. So from, from observing these three parameters, you can see that although the first parameter, which is alpha, represents a positive sign, which indicates that while you're increasing the temperature, you are increasing the current. However, the other two parameters, which are beta and gamma, represents a negative coefficient, which indicates that temper voltage as well as power, and of course power is the key parameter in the in the story, decrease while, while increasing the temperature. That's why operating solar cells under high temperature is considered a harsh condition as you are going to lose power. From this coefficient for this typical solar cell, you are going to lose 0.45% of your power by increasing your temperature over what we can call the normal operating cell temperature of a solar cell. So cooling a solar cell whenever you are operating under high temperature condition is between quotations a must. And herein, there is a lot of attempts to be implemented in order to make a cooling system. This can include what we can call a passive cooling techniques where you are doing this cooling without paying energy, without consuming energy, or what's called an active cooling technique using fan, using um, fluid, uh, cooling fluids, or whatever it is. In this context, we have proposed an hybrid energy harvester uh, uh, mechanism. So generally speaking, your solar cell surface will become with a high temperature 
as far as your ambient temperature increase. Typically, the solar cell norm operating cell temperature is from 10 to 20 degrees higher than the ambient temperature. So for example, if you are working in Egypt in summer with, an, with a degree of 40 degrees Celsius ambient, then your solar cell temperature can reach 60 or 60 above degrees Celsius. What will happen if we attach a thermal electrical harvester on the back side of a solar cell? Now, the attached surface, the tangent surface, will be considered as the hot surface, while the bottom, the counter surface, will be considered directed to ambient. So heat will flow from the higher region over the higher surface to the lower surface, creating what's called a thermoelectrical effect. In this case, in addition to the energy you are already extracting from a solar cell, you will already ex you will also ex extract energy from your thermoelectrical harvester. That's why you we consider this as a hyper source of energy. Another added value is due to this flow of heat transfer, you are doing some sort of a cooling for your solar cell. That's why we consider this as a hyper cooling, indirect cooling technique for your solar cell and getting more and more energy using the thermoelectrical harvest. As you know, this is a typical example for a CP coefficient where you have a delta V over delta T. So you have to search for a material with a good CB coefficient to be attached on the bottom side of a solar cell to act as a thermoelectrical harvester. And herein, by exploring literature, we found one of these materials that can act or can do this role is a carbon nanotubes. So in our case, we enroll or we utilize carbon nanotubes as a thermoelectrical harvesters. However, our carbon nanotubes were, were not alone we add graphene, graphite, and some sort of polymer in order to reach a recipe for an electrical harvester or thermoelectrical harvester. Again, back to the CB coefficient. We, here, we, when we consider a recipe, and maybe we will go to this curve where we demonstrate three different recipes or three different techniques or three different um, mixing uh, percentages for these four components. The variation we occurs here is simply represented by the Z coefficient. As for each recipe, we have a certain electrical conductivity sigma, a certain CP coefficient S, and a certain thermal conductivity K. So the one with the high Z coefficient will represents the highest performance. Of course, you can extract the CP coefficient from here because as you can see the X axis is the temperature and the Y axis is, uh, is, is power or voltage. Uh, of course, voltage and power are uh, somehow proportional. So you can somehow extract the, uh, is the CP coefficient from here. You can, of course, also make it somehow uh, easy. Maybe we will do so in the tutorial. You can make some sort of linearization for this curve so that you can capture the slope and the slope will represent the delta P over delta T or the the, the 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 variation in power with respect to the variation in uh, temperature. Uh, you can also go to simulations. One of the most powerful tools for that is console multiphysics um, because console support both uh, a heat transfer module and a semiconductor module. So uh, here we use console for this uh, uh, simulations and we do some uh, 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 comparison, let me say, between experimental data and uh, simulation attack. And by the end of the day, this was our output. We enhanced the output power of our solar cell by about 23.8%. And we extracted nearly about 0.5 milliwatt per solar cell as an extracted power due to the thermal, uh, to, due to the thermoelectrical harvester. And this is one of the models where you can integrate thermoelectrical harvesters with uh, large harvesters as an example. However, I can say that another extended 
work could, should be done in this perspective related to the cost analysis. Because usually, whenever you add a hybrid system or whenever you add a secondary source of energy to your primary source of energy, here our primary source of energy is light harvester and our secondary source of energy is a thermoelectric harvester. So you, you make some sort of cooling, you extract some extra power, but on the other hand, to make the balance, you have to know how much money you pay per kilowatt or per watt or whatever in order to do this enhancement, because this is a very important point concerning what we can call the visibility of your energy harvesters. Maybe in other courses, you, we will consider the economic analysis of energy harvesters, but maybe for this course, we are not going to, to consider that. But this is worth to be mentioned that it is not only important to consider enhancing an efficiency and all these uh, beautiful parameter enhancement, but it's also important to consider the cost paid toward reaching such an enhancement energy. That's all for this chapter, which is the thermoelectrical energy harvester. I think in the next chapter, we are going to tackle a new parameter uh, tool energy harvesting, which is a piezoelectrical energy harvester. Thank you very much for your concentration and see you in a next lecture. Enjoy.